Good morning and welcome home Shiloh. Here are some important updates and events at Shiloh Church. With Pastor Ken out today, our regularly scheduled first of the month communion will be next Sunday. The next men's breakfast is Saturday, August 10th at 9 a.m. The next ladies lunch bunch is Monday, August 12th at 1130 a.m. at Fletcher's at Clinton Hills. Please RSVP by August 9th by calling Linda at 618-806-6708. Join us as we celebrate back to school on August 18th with our back to school bash. We'll have special celebrations during service as well as a party after. Help us spread the word about Shiloh Church as we hit the streets in the O'Fallon Parade on August 24th. If you wish to walk with the float to pass out candy and goodies, please see Dave. Help support Impact Life by donating blood at our next blood drive on August 29th. Reservations can be made by scanning the QR code on the flyer. We are excited to launch our new traditional service on September 15th. To help ensure a successful start, we are forming a launch team of 30 people committed to attending the service through the 2024 year. If you would like to join this team, please see Pastor Ken or email churchoffice at the shilohchurch.org. Welcome home. God is good and all the time. Well, I got my notes here because I don't normally do this. I don't want to mess anything up because I know uh, Jordan's watching us from somewhere. So uh, I, I want to say good morning to you all. Good morning. And I want to say good morning to those that are watching online as well. Um, if, if you're a, and a special welcome to the guests. If this is the first time for you, we, do, we really appreciate you being here. And we're happy that you're here. Here's a QR code on the back of the chair in front of you. And if you scan that, that's got some important information about the church. And also, if you go to the, uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, it's a welcome center, yeah. That in the gathering area, uh, they've got a special gift for you. We've got a special treat today. And Pastor Phil, he's going to be uh, bringing us the message. Uh, you know, I heard something the other day. How old are you? You're going to be 88, and he's still serving the Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Anyway, that's a special treat, and he's going to speak to us about the centrality of our faith. So, uh, so why don't we pray? Lord God, it's only by the blood of your son, Jesus, that we can approach the throne of the Father. And we're excited to be here to worship you in spirit and truth. Please be with Pastor Phil as he brings your message to us. Open hearts, open minds, so that we're all profoundly affected by your word in preparation for the harvest that we know that's to come. Lord, touch the lives here like never before. Holy Spirit, we invite you here today to have your way with our hearts and our minds. Guide us, instruct us, empower us, and Lord, accept this worship as we glorify and praise your holy name. Lord, it is in your holy and powerful name that we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. that's right, let's worship. Oh, but before we do that, get up and say hello to somebody. steadfast love endures forever from Psalm 106, 1. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever.
time for jam. Head on to jam. Go ahead, Dave. Can you say God is good? And he is good all the time, right? That's why I love this song, because it just keeps repeating to us about the goodness of God. Here we go. Truly, God is good to the upright, to those who are pure in heart, Psalm 73, 1. about this I love this song Um, I feel like when you enter into the presence of the Lord there's something special that happens I'm gonna cry so don't don't judge me (laughs) but there's something that happens when the presence of the Lord comes down and meets us right where we are and right where our hearts are you don't have to be perfect to walk in that door you just have to come and say be with me because that's all he wants is just to be with you so as we sing this just remember that The Lord doesn't care what you're bringing in the door. He just wants to be with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you all of that I have said to you. John 14, 26. As the Spirit was moving over the Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Spirit was moving over the water. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest. 
rest on us. Calm down, spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you throw the room, you're here. One day a pastor was preaching, and all of a sudden a man got up in the middle of the sermon and walked out. And the pastor was 
bothered. He was disturbed because he thought maybe he said something that really caused the fellow to leave. And so when it was over, he went to his wife and he said, did I say something that offended your husband? Oh, no, she said, don't pay any attention to him. Said he walks in his sleep quite often. <laughs> so, so, so if you get up during the sermon, you'll know what I'm thinking. It's our purpose today to look at the central figure of our faith, which is Jesus Christ. We know that his birth, his ministry, his death and resurrection are recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yet his life is explained in modern terms in a very unique way. I want you to listen to these words by a man whom we do not even know. He was born in an obscure village. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then he became an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family or owned a house. He never went to college. He never visited a large city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things that one usually associates with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed on a cross between two thieves. When he was dying, the executioners gambled for his clothing, which were the only thing that he owned in this world. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Centuries have come and gone. And today he remains the central figure of, our, of the human race, the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected life in mankind on this planet so much as that one solitary life. These are powerful words, but they're very, very true. But I want to look more deeply this morning into the solitary life whom Paul called the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. First, Jesus is referred to as the Son of God. All one has to do is read the very first verse in the Gospel of Mark. And these words catch our attention. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Then reading in the first chapter of John, these, the same truth begins to emerge. After a brief encounter with Jesus, the words of Nathan open our eyes. Teacher, you are the Son of God, the King of all Israel. These recognitions boldly refer to us that Jesus is divine, that he is the fulfillment of all biblical prophecies as the one who would come into the world, rule and reign, making the entire world a better and different place. Yet, folks, we have to come to grips with this. This affirmation precludes that Jesus was born of an earthly mother but a heavenly father. This has been a stumbling block for many people down through the years. But the scriptures are very clear. And I want you to listen to these words from Matthew, the first chapter. This is how the birth of Jesus came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph was her husband and a righteous man, he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. And he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home with you 
because what isn't conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now, folks, whether you believe that or not, that's every one of you to decide. But that's what we affirm when we, pre- when we repeat the Apostles' Creed. The idea is paramount in the Bible. It is the Son of God, that Jesus Christ, that Paul preached to the church at Corinthians. Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus that to come to the knowledge of the Son of God was the very essence of a mature Christian faith. All through the Bible it is very clear that the idea of Jesus as the Son of God is a part of the liturgy, the teachings, the preachings of all of his followers. Jesus is the Son of God. And to believe otherwise is to deny one of the central teachings of our faith. Now secondly, Jesus is referred to as the Son of Man. The term is used some 70 times in the New Testament alone. Jesus often spoke of himself as the Son of Man. If you turn to the ninth chapter of Matthew, verse 6, Jesus speaks, You may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. As I thought about this, I know that there's some theological reasons for this. But I want to drop right down to the bottom line, and I want to put it in the vernacular so that we all understand it. It would seem to me that Jesus used this term to identify more closely to the people whom he came to minister. Chiefly to those who were lost and in need of a Savior and to comfort and heal those physically as well as those with spiritual needs. If we look closely, folks, at the idea that Jesus was the Son of Man and he came to bring hope and salvation to the world, we begin to realize that everybody who had an encounter with Jesus realized that his life needed to be changed and he alone could provide a path whereby each person could find that liberating freedom that is open to all people who trust him. Not long ago, a very short time ago, I read a book entitled Forgive, written by Timothy Keller. He wrote the book shortly before he died after a long battle with cancer. The book relates a story that we need to hear this morning. He said Tom Skinner was an African-American evangelist who was born and raised on the streets of New York. He was converted, and in his memoir he wrote, Black and Freed, Black and Free, 2 Corinthians 5:17. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. He said, if I had not been reached by Jesus Christ, I would either be dead, in prison, or part of a gang. Jesus Christ is alive in me, he said. And he relates an incident that took place shortly after he became a Christian. In a football game, several weeks after he had accepted Christ, He said, my Christian love was put on display. He said, I played left guard on the team. It was my job to, on end runs or off tackle plays to run interference for the halfback. So when the quarterback called an end run play, I pulled out and blocked the defensive end, knocking him out of the play. And the halfback went through and scored. We were getting up from the ground heading back to the huddle, and the kid that I had blocked got up and he was furious. He jumped in front of me, hit me in the stomach. As I bent over, he hit me on the blow of the back of the neck. And after I hit the ground, he kicked me, shouting some very derogatory terms. Under the, uh, under the other circumstances, Old Tom Skinner would have gotten up and pulverized the young man because he said, you have to realize I was brought up on the streets of New York. 
and I knew how to defend myself. But instead, I got up from the ground, and I said to him, You know, because I've had an encounter with Jesus Christ, I love you, man. I love you. The kid threw his helmet on the ground, ran off the field, and of course he couldn't play the rest of the game. When the game was over, he met me in the locker room, and he said, Tom, you have done more to show me a better way of life by telling me that you loved me after the way I acted, more than if you would have gotten up and socked me in the jaw. Folks, that's the very reason that Jesus Christ came into the world, to show us a better way, to open the pathway to God, and to make a way that could change the human heart. Remember what Jesus said? I have come so that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The way that abundant life is open to each of us is to believe in Jesus who gave his life so that the door would be open to forgiveness and freedom. It's then that the experience, we experience that radical transformation that is promised. If any person is in Christ, he's a new creature. Lastly, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. These words are powerful. Because without the resurrection, Jesus would have been a well-known historical figure, but he would never have been the Savior. He would have been a wise teacher, but never a person who would start the greatest movement in the world. He would have been a good person, but his impact would have been minimal at the very most. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is without a doubt one of the greatest events that has ever taken place in our world. We can pass over some of the other doctrines. But I want to say to you this morning that if you are to be a true follower of Jesus Christ, you have to believe in the resurrection. Why? Because the scriptures and history tells us that it's based on fact. When we read the New Testament, there's a list of people who saw him, who ate with him, who talked with him for a full 40 days before he ascended. They had a personal encounter with the risen Christ. Sometimes it was in the upper room. Sometimes it was on a walk on the road. And other times it was during a fishing experience. Thus, it is the belief of all Christians that death is not the end. It's only the beginning. With this I close. A boy on a high school team, football team, was not very dependable. He liked to hear the cheers, but he didn't like the practice. He loved to wear the suit, but he didn't like the drills that would make him a better player. And one day when the players were doing their laps, the kid was slowly doing his, and the coach came over and said, Hey, kid, I just received a telegram for you. The kid said, Read it to me, coach. The coach opened the telegram and read these words. Son, your father has just died. Come home immediately. The coach looked at him and said, take the rest of the week off. And the following Friday, when the team played a game, something happened. The young man was the first player on the team. No sooner had the gun sounded than the coach was saying, the young man was saying to the coach, let me play, let me play. The first quarter ended with the score not very well. At halftime, the coach gave a rousing talk and thought it might change the tide, but it didn't. Every time the coach turned around, the young man was saying, please let me play, please let me get into the game, please, coach, please. Finally, the coach looked up at the scoreboard. He said, well, it's not very good, and the team isn't playing very well. He can't do any harm, so he put him in. No sooner had the young man hit the field than the team began to explode. The young man ran and blocked and tackled 
like a star. The enthusiasm influenced the team. And all of a sudden, the score began to move up. And it wasn't long until they were even. And in the last few seconds of the game, the young man intercepted a pass, ran it back to the goal line, and won the game. The stands cheered. The team put the young man on their shoulders. The celebration was overwhelming. When the excitement finally was over, the coach went over to the young man and he said, Young man, well, I've never seen you play like that in my life. What happened to you out there? And he said, Coach, you remember last week my dad died. Coach said, yes, I read you the telegram. He said, well, coach, my dad was blind, and this is the first day he ever saw me play. What made that young man make such a claim? These words. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid. You're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen. Folks, I want to say to you this morning that the Christian church has a great message. We preach the greatest hope that this world has ever known. We have a gospel that is unmatched and powerful. And that is why Jesus Christ has become the central figure of our faith. Is it any wonder that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, for God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him. Jesus Christ is the central figure of our faith. And folks, we can't get away from that. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come into your presence this morning, I pray that in my own humble way, I've tried to exalt you above all other names. Father, I realize that you're the one who is the cornerstone of the church. You're the one that can come into a human life and change it. You're the one who has said, death is not the end, it's only the beginning. And Lord, I want to thank you for your presence. I want to thank you for your love. And I want to thank you for the great message that we have in the New Testament that exalts you above all other names. Guide and direct us. For we ask it in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. As Pastor often says, this is our response time. And so this is our time to respond to God for his continuing grace and mercy and provision. Regarding provision, our tithes and offerings, uh, they're usually received online, but there is a box right over there. But guests... I want you to know that that box is not for you. That's for the members here that support this church. You are our guest. So if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, you know, tomorrow's not promised. Now's the time to do that. Maybe you'd like to rededicate your life to the purposes of God. Maybe you have a need that's too much for you to handle on your own. That's most of my needs, and I need to turn to the Lord for that. Or maybe you've prayed for something, and you've received a victory in your life, and you need to bring that up. That's every bit as important to come up and pray about. So whatever the need or the thanksgiving, now's the time. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for the opportunity to be here to worship with you to learn, and to pray. Thank you that you hear us and answer our prayers with perfect timing. Lord, we don't always understand the answers or the whys, but we do know that we need you. We need you in every moment of our lives. We need you in our healing. We need you in our finances. We need you in our relationships. Lord, show us your presence in our lives. Touch each of our hearts and minds in a way that only you can. Lord, hear these prayers that your people now bring to you. 
Folks, as we remain in an attitude of prayer and the prayer partners, they're gonna station themselves about the sanctuary here. And we're gonna sing a song of, of supplication. Come to the open throne. And it's the open throne because Jesus, Jesus tore that curtain. So come to the open throne of the living God with your petitions. Don't, don't put it off any longer. Come. Come not because you're told that you have to, but come because he allows you to. Come. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in faithfulness to you. Psalm 26, verse 3. Grand earth has quaked before Moved by the sound of his voice In seas that are shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken from my regard And through it all, through it all and through it all, through it all, it is well. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you, and it is well with me. Do 
Lord Jesus, you've heard our prayers. Consider each of your servants here. Answer them in your perfect timing and in your perfect way. And may the glory for all that's happening be yours and yours alone for all that you've done in our lives and all that you're about to do. For these things, we give you thanks in the name of your holy and precious name. Amen. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. 1 Peter 3, verse 18. I stand. Why don't we stand? It just occurred to me when I sang that word. I stand amazed at the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner unkempt unclean singing how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall singing how marvelous come into your presence, recognizing that your love for us was even beyond human understanding at times. For you went into the garden and you prayed, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And the reason you did that and the reason you shed your blood was so that everyone here could know you as Lord and Savior. Dismiss us now with the love of Christ abiding in our hearts. And may we go out and be your ambassadors, for we ask it in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. <laughs>